Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining me today. Christina Bauer with the Texas Lime Alliance. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's really great to see you and uh, thanks for joining us. I wanted to uh, discuss a couple of hot topics with you today about your book and uh, what you've been working on since then. Uh, but first, I'd like to go over an introduction for our audience about you. Chris Newby is an award-winning science writer and the senior producer of the Lyme disease documentary, Under Our Skin, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival, Festival and was a 2010 Oscar semifinalist. She has two degrees in engineering, a bachelor's degree from the University of Utah and a master's degree from Stanford University. Previously, she was a technology writer for Apple and other Silicon Valley companies, and she currently lives in Palo Alto. So welcome again, and thanks for meeting with us today. I uh, wanted to go over a couple of questions with you. Um, the first thing is the obvious burning question is, why did you write the book Bitten? Which was excellent, by the way. Thanks. Um, in 2002, my husband and I and our two boys in middle school went to Martha's Vineyard for a week's vacation. And uh, we had a great time there. Went sailing to this sort of obscure island off Martha's Vineyard, which uh, in the past was a military target practice. <laughs> and anyways, we went back to California. And a week later, my husband and I were sicker than we'd ever been. And that sort of started that uh, changed the course of my life in ways I never could have anticipated. But my husband and I got sicker than we'd ever been before. And we uh, went to our primary care physician who we didn't know very well because we were so healthy. And uh, they told us, oh, you're sick, but it's probably just a summer flu virus, go mm -hmm. away and come back if you're still sick in a week or two. And a couple of days later, we just said, we are like really seriously sick. Uh, you know, classic flu symptoms, but so weak and muscle achy and fevers and night sweats that I had to crawl on my hands and knees on this up the stairs just to get to my bedroom. Uh, yeah, back in a few days, and they said, "No, it's just a virus." I consulted with the head of infectious diseases. You're fine, and you know, so that's just started this year-long um, falling into the medical abyss with an undiagnosed disease and. You know, because I'm an engineer, I'm super organized and I had lists of symptoms and when they started and um, everyone. So it, we saw 10 doctors in a year and it cost us probably $60,000 uh, top line for to get diagnosed with two tick-borne diseases, Lyme disease and babesiosis. And, you know, along the way, every one of those doctors I saw, I said, you know, we were in Martha's Vineyard. It was like the number one state for Lyme disease, can you test us for Lyme disease? And the first eight doctors go, no, you know, it's a rare disease and it doesn't present with the symptoms you have. You know? Right. And, uh, you know, six months into the disease, we were just completely, my husband and I were completely disabled. I couldn't work anymore. My husband was faking it because we needed medical insurance to figure out what was wrong. Because we, <laughs> at some point we were silently thinking we are dying and we're going to leave our kids for orphans. Uh, you know, and finally, sort of the breaking point was my community physician, chief of infectious diseases says, um, uh, you know, you guys, uh, and he's an infectious diseases guys, you have a psychosomatic couples thing. And, you oh know, my applying that I'm a hypochondriac trying to get attention from my husband, who's a successful Silicon Valley exec. And I was faking the symptoms so that I could get attention from my husband and my husband was feeling sympathy pains, you know, and at that point we had, uh, you know, pretty much every organ system was screaming at us. We had irritable bowel, uh, chronic fatigue, early onset I, uh, Alzheimer's, you know, our, our brains were not working. And, you know, then I went to, the, I said, I quit that doctor and I went to the academic medical center in my neighborhood and, um, the infectious diseases guys there tested us for every disease known to man pretty much and finally ordered a Lyme test after almost a year and it came up positive for me and a positive ELISA and then uh, I went back in and they, they were hiding the results from me and I said but what about the Lyme test and he goes oh 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 yeah and he pulls it out like he was trying to hide it oh that was 
that was positive, but that's a really bad test, you know? Oh and uh, he says, yeah, it's a bad test. And so, you know, I was, that was the first positive test we'd had since the beginning of our ordeal. And I went home and I just Googled on CDC and it said, well, if you get a positive ELISA, you have to do a positive Western blot. So I called them back and I said, hey, you didn't do this next step. And they said, oh, oh. And they pretended like they didn't know that. And they tested again and it was positive again, but then they, they fired us as patients. They said, I'm sorry, we just don't have the tools here to treat people like you. <laughs> you know? Wow. And it, and it was because uh, that university hospital had an unwritten policy. We don't treat chronic Lyme patients. Uh, and, you know, they didn't want to risk their political careers to treat us for a disease. It didn't matter that their symptomology and their, you know, their, their attitudes took an easily treatable disease in both of us to a chronic disease that would take, you know, five or six years for us to get over a lot of out of pockets expenses, but, you know, they didn't want to risk their careers to treat us. So anyways, luckily I went online with groups like yours, you know, that just save people every day. Thank you. Um, you know, you tell them, get a second opinion. We did. We found a, an experienced Lyme doctor in our neighborhood um, and went to her and then we were on the road to recovery. It was longer than we ever would have imagined, but uh, you know, now we are back to normal lives. So I would just say that to people in the middle of it, have hope, have faith, you know, there's better treatments every day, like the disulfiram. Um, so keep the faith, be patient and don't stick with a doctor that's not treating you with respect and working with you to get you better. Oh, that's excellent. My heart just goes out to you and your husband for what y'all have been through. We have been through that times five. Um, it's been very difficult, especially here in Texas. A little bit about me. I'm the director of Texas Lyme Alliance, just for the audience. I know you know this. Uh, I have a, a Facebook group. It's called the Disulfiram Experience for Lyme Support Group. And Disulfiram has been a game changer for a lot of people, but it does need to be used with caution. So I have also started um, two websites to try and get out these interviews that I do with um, Lyme disease clinicians who are experts in utilizing the therapy disulfiram. So we also have a lot of treatment guidance from those experts and a pharmacologist who has experience with Lyme disease and mental health, which Lyme disease is a, a central nervous system and brain infection. So she comes in handy quite often helping with some non-medical guidance. She is retired. So uh, none of us do make um, you know medical recommendations for anybody. I certainly never pretend to be a doctor. I'm just a mom who's been through this experience over eight long years, but it did take us like you, it took us years and um, took me 30 years, uh, 32 to be exact, to get a proper diagnosis and doctors from all over. But um, I just want to reiterate what you had said to our audience is I really don't have the aches and pains and joint aches and all that that I used to have. But same, same as you, I was early onset Alzheimer's, fibromyalgia. Um, I was actually diagnosed with Crohn's disease after a bowel obstruction perforated through, almost died in Las Vegas. Um, right before Mother's Day. So that was crazy news for Mom's Day to my mom. But nonetheless, you, you were getting better. breakfast in bed, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what you said that keep the hope for you guys out there listening to um, us talking about how we've gotten better. It, support group is real, real important. And Facebook groups, as silly as it might sound to clinicians and researchers and experts, are life-saving. And these moms and other parents who have gone through treating their children and gotten them better, it's real important that people reach out to people who understand rather than relying on family and friends who just aren't ever going to get it unless they do you know, get Lyme disease. So um, keep the faith and have the hope because if we did it, you guys can do it too. And um, it does take time and money. So 
I wanted to talk a little bit about your book. There was uh, some conversation circling around uh, Representative Chris Smith from New, New Jersey, who amended the annual DOD budget bill to call for an investigation into the tick weaponization program that you so eloquently lay out. Um, whatever happened with that investigation? Well, um, what happened is my book came out in hardbound a year year and a half ago about. And as soon as, well, Chris Smith is in New Jersey, which is at sort of ground zero of the epidemic. Yeah. It broke out in the late sixties and now it's a, a serious health problem for his district. So he read the book and he, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, he waved it around C-SPAN and he was in the middle of the DO, Department of Defense budget process. And he says, wow, this book has shocking allegations. It's very well-researched, it's credible. Mm -hmm. And if the United States government in the Cold War bioweapons program experimented with ticks and other arthropods, eight-legged creatures, um, weaponizing them and doing open-air experiments, we need to investigate it and reveal it. Uh, so that sort of exploded my world because <laughs> that was a news bite it was before all the Trump craziness and everyone around the world was calling me up. But uh, anyways, you know, I thought it was great because all these experiments happened. You know, this crazy, crazy three tick-borne diseases showed up in 1968 around Long Island, Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts. So the three crazy bugs were, um, of course, Lyme arthritis, uh, which, you know, Burley Burgdorferi, that spirochete, or a, a cousin of it has been around since the ice ages in Europe, but for some reason, yeah. weird, strange showed up. And then on Long Island, there was an anomalous spotted fever. That's spotted fever is the most deadly tick-borne disease in the U.S. And um, uh, a weird strain showed up that the Lyme discoverer Willie Bergdorferi flagged, and it was killing people, but it didn't test positive to the known rickettsia spotted fever sort of organisms. And then there's B Babesia which um, was the disease that's near and dear to me because I had it and it's a bad disease. Or we bad all had it too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, it causes air hunger and inflammation of your whole vascular system. Uh, it's a lot of the headachey stuff that you get. And you really, you, you can't, I don't think you can get rid of it ever. Uh, you can't, you and I can't give blood now, for example. But anyways, right. that cattle, it was a cattle born parasite and it was first in man around that time, the, um, around the late sixties, it showed up around Massachusetts where I got it. And it had only been identified in man five other places. This was the second place in the U S so it was a weird outbreak. So, <laughs> right. <clears throat> Anyways, back to Chris Smith, you know, I researched my book Bitten on the secret history of Lyme disease and how we used insects in the weaponized weaponization program. And there were a lot of open air tests without any kind of security. There were lab breaches, um, accidents, and I haven't been able to get those documents during the five years of research of my book. So it was great that he was calling for a disclosure of those documents. Um, and it will, you know, the important thing about that is the question is, you know, has, have those experiments affected humans, you know, the, those accidents? And when they did open air experiments, where did they do them? What were the organisms that they released? And in the development of those weaponized insects, what measures did they research to protect their soldiers? that might benefit fit us now. So it would save us current research dollars to have that information out. You know, the people who ordered those experiments are dead now mostly. So let's, let's shine the light on these experiments. So anyways, that was the idea, but um, that investigation got pulled in December in the middle of the post-election craziness. So it's a dead end. Oh <laughs> I no. Still um, but Chris Smith is talking about um, trying to pass it as a standalone investigation, a bill. So we'll see. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah. He has been uh, 
pretty great advocate for Lyme disease patients and Susan Collins and the Kay Hagen Tick Act has done some good for us. And we're hoping with the uh, new appropriations that were funded for uh, 2021 that we worked on with the Center for Lyme Action in 2020, that we get some new researchers um, to show up at the table and submit grants because there's a lot of new money coming out for Lyme disease research. And so I really encourage anyone listening um, who may know of a researcher or who is a researcher to submit those grants to try and get those uh, funds for persistent Lyme disease research and what's happened around um, the epidemic because we are at pandemic proportions now. I think the CDC has just put out their new estimation at 476,000 new cases a year, uh, but because of faulty testing, there was a study done in 2005 that identified the Lyme disease testing uh, to be 61% uh, false negatives. So I think the 476,000 is very low case count with new infection rates every year. The CDC says that it is likely 10 times that. So it would be great to see some of this stuff as far as the investigation with Chris Smith and these new research dollars to circle around identifying the problem, solving the problem, and preventing new problems from other people getting sick and infected. So uh, I just have to say, your book is amazing, and I don't want to forego mentioning that to the audience. This isn't a marketing spiel to sell your book, but so be it. It's excellent everyone who has any um, relationship to ticks, tick-borne illness, definitely would do themselves a favor by reading it. I got it on Audible and listened to it within two days twice. <laughs> wow. it twice within like two, two and a half days. I don't know how I did that, but it was just like a, I just couldn't get enough because when you start really diving into your book, it's laid out so well that you really just can't believe what's happened. And the denial um, is is quite significant all the way throughout that you outline so well. It's very clearly written and and it is very well researched. So I thought it was really great at um, one of the last conferences that we saw each other at, I guess it was maybe Live Lime in Colorado. Yeah, Colorado, yeah. Okay, so do you remember the gentleman who started kind of questioning you that was sitting at the table with you, the older gentleman, and you were like, I loved how you addressed it. I was, I take this with me from that day. You said something like, uh, I see I've got you thinking. And I thought, God, she's so good. Instead of like, oh gosh, what do I say? You were like, thumbs up, dude. Uh, I've got you thinking and that's really great. And that's uh, spurring conversation around tick-borne illness, what's happened around the weaponization of insects and how it's gotten out is very similar relating to uh, the COVID situation um, coming out of China that uh, we don't really know exactly. So I don't want to circle too much around that idea, but the problems around both of them are pretty identical. The treatments, um, pretty well, yeah, identical. The, yeah. I mean, the central question of the book when I started the research is I get a confession from Willie Bergdorfer, I, or Bergdorfer, who first identified the Lyme spirochete and they said, oh, all this illness in this, you know, Lyme Connecticut area is caused by this one germ, uh, you know, one and done, two weeks antibiotics cure it, you know. So the central question of the book is when I, he finally said, yeah, there were other organisms that we discovered at ground zero, but we were told to sweep them under the rug and that had weighed heavily on his conscience. And so the central question is like, well, what were the other germs? And could that explain why 15 to 20% of people who supposedly just have Lyme go on to become chronically ill? You know, is it the persistence of this Lyme spirochete or is it the Lyme spirochete, you know, the germ gangbang of the other germs with it? And so because he emitted that really important scientific information and you could tell it bugged him, you know, did we close the door on a really important, you know, path for research? 
So I was hoping that the book would not polarize as much as many of the other things in the Lyme world have done in the past, but it would spark the curiosity of scientists. Well, you know, what is this thing that Willie covered up? And, you know, is it a rickettsia? Is it something else? Um, and so, I mean, I have run across a lot of scientists who've read it and, you know, it's like, oh, that's an interesting research question. Let's, let's look into that, which is good. And then it also informs Lyme patients. It isn't just Lyme, you know, you need to really explore the Lyme co-infections. And if you that's go to right. just your primary care physician, they'll say Babesia, what, <laughs> you know, anaplasma, what? <laughs> so you need to need an experienced captain to, you know, guide you through these treacherous waters. <laughs> yeah, keep digging. I yeah. think is what, yeah, summing all that up is that's exactly right is work with somebody who's not going to be satisfied with I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I say in this uh, situation, doctors take an oath to do no harm. And my response to that is, uh, well, doing nothing is doing harm. Right. Yeah, and we, that's what we all get is, is unexplained hypochondria or crazy or psychosomatic, whatever you want to call it. It's in your head. People are, are told that all along. And I was even told um, for years and years, you're the healthiest sick person that I know. And I dread seeing you on my schedule. Um, she put her head in her hands and laughed. And But that's not a good thing to tell a patient who can't get the help that they need, that you dread seeing them on the schedule. And what she meant by that was she doesn't know how to help me. So as she was putting her head in her hands, so was I. <laughs> Maybe that's a good time to bring up the research term that's such a farce and, and I think causing a lot of this blocking of the access to care for patients is definitely a, around research and the use of the term post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome or PTLDS. Do you have any comment around how that term is being used in research that is also being conflated into uh, blocking access to care for patients as it has been conflated as an actual diagnosis on CDC and IH? If you click on the references at the bottom of the um, websites, it takes you to research for MUS, which is unexplained symptoms. Can you clarify in your own perspective? Yeah. How you, I know that's a mouthful. I just spouted <laughs> it off. But <laughs> well, I mean, like you, like you, I'm pretty offended by the term, the invented large string of uh, alphabet soup, the post treatment Lyme disease syndrome, and I especially the word syndrome, bee, 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 you know, inflames my emotions because syndrome implies there's not a root cause to the disease. You know, if right. you have a disease, you test positive for it, you treat it with the drug that's supposed to help you, which is some sort of antibiotic and you get better. And then you stop that and your symptoms come back, then it's probably the same thing. Don't call it a syndrome. Uh, don't say that we patients just enjoy being sick and we love going to the doctors and spending a lot of money that way and not working. Um, I love the quote, ask a, a healthy person what their dreams are and they'll tell you a thousand, but a sick person has just one dream, you know, to just get back to normal. Just get better. So, um, you know, I really, what drove me to do the documentary Under Our Skin, which you can watch for free if you have an Amazon Prime Sure. My husband and I got sick when I was in the middle of recovery. So I was still sick when I did this. I helped and this very talented filmmaker, Andy um, Abrahams Wilson, do this documentary. And what drove me is I just don't understand what I'm seeing as a sort of a logical engineer and a tech writer. The symptoms that I saw in the field when I was researching that documentary, which are thousands of really sick people, and then what was in the medical literature, it's like so vastly different. And the established researchers who got all the NIH money, they were really expressing that Lyme disease is overdiagnosed and two to four weeks of doxycycline will cure it. And, and their symptom set was so narrow. I mean, like, so, I mean, what, what I really did in that film was dig down and I followed the money. So what I found is this original group of researchers who published widely about the disease they said uh, it's easy to treat, easy to cure. They were all involved in a vaccine trial. 
And in that vaccine trial, how could you possibly create a vaccine, a rigorous scientific vaccine trial, if you're dealing with a messy disease with a symptom set that hits every organ of the body, especially the neurological system, ill-defined, and oh, by the way, the test isn't very good. So you can't possibly run a vaccine trial. So I, I feel like those original researchers were on the take in that they were invested in the success of this vaccine. It certainly enriched them and their universities. So they sort of got stuck in this lie. And then now those um, researchers, a lot of them hold really senior positions in their universities and they don't wanna say, oh, uh, sorry, I was wrong. It is, It can be chronic, the symptoms um, and uh, the test isn't that great. And oh, by the way, we have patents on, you know, some of them had patents on those tests. Personal patents, that's right. Right, right. So, and even the CDC did because the CDC changes that happened right around when the Lyme disease was discovered, CDC and the researchers involved in the, the test development could receive up to $140,000 a year in royalties. So, you know, Everybody was financially invested in uh, in the lie. I mean, I would say it was another big lie. So now we're stuck with that definition from the 90s when the vaccine was released and, and then pulled, uh, even though it was pulled. So we're stuck with the test that uses the markers that were the, the markers that were significant in the vaccine. They're pulled out. So we have a very insensitive test. So anyways, that's what the film was about, was sort of it at a high level went into the the explanation of how money and ego sort of set the science off on the wrong path. And what we really need is a reset. And even Willie Bergdorfer said that we need uh, to start over again with the science. Um, when did he make that assumption? That's been decades ago, but can you remember? Well, I, I was reading my uh, interview notes with him last night. So that was February 3rd, 2007 where he said, we need to give research money to the people who don't know the answers to their research questions before they start the research. And he said, the Lyme disease research is a shameful affair. So, you know, recent, what the project I'm working on now is sort of analyzing where the grant money has gone for the last decade. And I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, to try to explain it to outsiders. I mean, the thing I hate the most for people who don't have Lyme disease is, well, if there's a bad test, why don't they fix it? <laughs> It's like, oh, how long do you have? Just watch this film. But, um, yeah. So I, I just recently went through the last five years of NIH Lyme research, and I actually read the abstracts and the proposals for 335 research projects that are being funded. And wow. even I was just appalled at the what the results are. So, you know, we have all these really chronically ill people. So of the last five years of the, I think $135 million that went into research, only 1% of those research dollars are going to treatments for the sick people, only 1%. And a lot of it's going to making mice healthy who have Lyme disease in the labs, you know, 1% is going to treatments. And I just think that is completely wrong and we need to fix that. And it's because we've bought into the lie that two to four weeks of antibiotics will cure these people with really complicated diseases. I, I was listening to your interview with Dr. Kinderlayer, who uh, has a lot of the really sickest people who have messy, messy and very sensitive infection. patient group. Yeah. And I just, uh, my heart went out to them because he has such a hard job. And I wish a lot of the naysayer physicians could watch that to know that, you know, these doctors, yeah, there's some quacks out there, but most of these doctors are just stuck with these patients and it's a, uh, it's really frustrating for them, like you said, and they just want to get their patients better. Yeah, and um, it's not remiss to mention that he is a Lyme patient himself, mm -hmm. and in part two discusses his own personal journey with not getting the proper care early on. He uh, tested positive, CDC positive twice, not once. And still couldn't get the care he needed and was a physician calling physicians for help. So it's real important for people to hear, like, we can't scream this louder from the rooftops. This is science suppression. This 
term PTLDS is a cover up of a very messy situation. And um, we have to start resetting research agendas and calling out those people who are new researchers looking to start establishing themselves um, in, in research. Okay, I finally found it. If y'all see me digging on my computer, I am. Uh, the uh, active NIH research projects related to Lyme disease as of January 2021 pretty much tell the story. There's only been one research grant granted um, on treatment and it was only for $112,360. Neurologic, uh, only one research grant. Co-infections, four research grants on persistence, four, that's it. Arthritis, seven. Immunology, six. Tick and host control, 19. Diagnostics, 14. Vaccine, 13. And basic general research, 58 grants totaling $27,353,416 for a total of 47% of all of the research grants conducted were on basic research. Number two being vaccine, the least of those being treatment and number three diagnostics. But as we know, it's so poorly defined that that money's likely been wasted. Um, we still to date don't have a good diagnostic tool or treatment. So um, it's completely beyond me why the two things that could solve this problem are getting the least funding and the diagnostics being number three most funded in Lyme disease research grants. So I, I wanted to break in and talk about the problem with the diagnostic testing is um, yeah, we, good. in the U.S. we have no good test for right. the first month because it's all antibody testing and it takes your body about three weeks to develop a, antibody, an antibody yeah. levels that can actually be measured. I, I further analyzed how much in the last five years, like where the what kind of diagnostics they're working on. And it's mostly antibody testing. So it's just the same approach that hasn't worked so far. And, you know, where that might work with a strep or something like that, uh, we're talking about people with multiple tick-borne diseases and a lot of them, their immune systems are working overtime fighting multiple infections. So their antibodies are tied up in these sort of like fur balls that aren't detected with these very, very specific one pathogen tests. So I think it was like 35% are antibody tests. The biggest chunk is going to antibody tests. And, you know, I, I, I was a science writer at Stanford for almost 10 years, and there are just a lot of really exciting direct detection technologies now that will test for DNA. So the PERPs, you know, the the organisms are actually causing the disease. And like, why haven't we moved on to this really crude antibody approach? And a lot of it is because those original researchers have patents, their original patents on antibody testing ran out, but now they've made new ones. That's right. <laughs> they, they filed for new patents. So we need to let the new blood come in, the people that know genomics and <laughs> so. And so that's important to mention the genomics as I think a, a big picture of it that really goes denied. But um, this all leads me to that second question. Those main authors that you're talking about are being called to, to the floor in the uh, law room of the uh, Tory versus IDSA trial, where I wanted to mention the most important thing here is I heard it for years. There's no Lyme in Texas. And even when I go to advocate here in Texas, which I kind of stopped wasting my time because I was driving to Austin uh, four plus hours for to sit in a chair and have the person I was speaking to watch the clock, not listen to me, plead for help for my kids. And, you know, the, the science is being suppressed by these original Lyme authors for the IDSA guidelines starting in 2000, which we just got new ones from them in 2020 that are the exact same. Nothing's changed. There's still a denial of congenital Lyme, which 
I have four here in my home, but I see it all the time with patients that I help on my forum and others that it's really prevalent. And um, the denying that fact, along with the fact that this Tory versus Idsa lawsuit is talking about what's happened here. And eight major insurance companies have settled out of court. Uh, people who are innocent do not do that. They don't do that. They mm -hmm. prove they're innocent and then we move on. They didn't do that. They settled financially out of court. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the Tory, the Tory versus IDSA case um, filed by 21 chronic Lyme patients against the IDSA and six authors of the IDSA Lyme treatment guidelines in the insurance companies the suit essentially charges that the six Lyme researchers have been in cahoots with the insurance companies to deny appropriate medical treatment to patients with Lyme disease. All the insurance companies has settled out of court, as I mentioned, but the IDSA and the six defendants will go to trial uh, sometime in September of 2021. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how these same people are, thank God, being called to task to uh, be held accountable, hopefully, and in some level of transparency with what's transpired with this test and why they're being called to uh, prove themselves innocent. Yeah, so they, uh, there are 21 plaintiffs, so um, Lyme patients who were mistreated, misdiagnosed, um, and it sounds like they have pretty good, strong cases witnessed by all the insurance companies settling. But the, I think it was six or seven of the physician researchers, uh, I think all of them were involved in one of the three IDSA treatment guidelines that have been published. There was um, 2006 and now 2020, and there was one before that. So they're very invested in that. And IDSA is paying their legal fees. And so you have oh, to That's ask. an important thing that I didn't realize. Yeah. So why is that? Well, what is it's a, it's infectious diseases society of America. Uh, they are sort of match.com for big pharma and, uh, academic researchers to, you know, bring those two together. You have a drug, you need it tested. Here's an infectious disease doctor that will help you with that research. So it's, um, you know, it's about money, I think. And well, they're uh, a private it, society, right? They're That's a private a, society, like a, like a corporation, and, right? And the way IDSA makes money is big pharma buys really expensive ads in the journals that they publish, and uh, you know the Lyme guidelines people easily publish in the, their journals, and they hold really expensive conferences where the big pharma buys overpriced booths so they can reach these prescribers, the infectious disease doctors, and market their drugs. So uh, it's a publishes, last I checked, it was like 50 or 60 guidelines for various diseases. So it's a way, you have a busy frontline physicians with a patient with a disease, it's a way to market their drugs to patients, this whole ecosystem. So for them to have these upstart feisty patients overturn one of their guidelines, that's, that's just appalling. And they don't want to set a precedence that patients can demand to have guidelines that harm them removed. So, I mean, one thing I, I saw while I was in an academic institution is patients are getting more power. They, they are getting on committees. The NIH is realizing you need to have the patient perspective on how their tax dollars are spent to cure the diseases that they have. It can't just be up to these ivory tower researchers to decide where the money goes. Oh, they need to pay the salaries of their postdocs and they need to bring in a certain amount of money to their universities to keep their lab bunch benches in their tenured positions. So, you know, it's all about getting patients better. And what we've seen in Lyme disease is that these academic researchers who are, have an agenda now their agenda is they don't want to get sued for malpractice by everyone they've ever mistreated. So that's part of what's going on. <laughs> that's a really excellent account. Thank you for that. It's um, pretty astonishing to me that people don't realize that a lot of these same doctors who are in charge are the original Lyme authors 
to the ITSA guidelines and are being sued 